Matryona frowned and stood behind the stove looking to see what they would do. Simon took off his cap and sat down on the bench as if things were all right. Come, Matryona, if supper is ready, let us have some. Matryona muttered something to herself and did not move but stayed where she was by the stove. She looked first at the one and then the other of them and only shook her head. Simon saw that his wife was annoyed, but tried to pass it off. Pretending not to notice anything, he took the stranger by the arm. Sit down, friend, said he, and let us have supper. Have some supper. The stranger sat down on the bench. Haven't you cooked anything for us, said Simon? Matrina's anger boiled over. I've cooked, but not for you. It seems to me you have drunk your wits away. You went to buy a sheepskin coat, but come home without so much as a coat as you had on to bring a naked vagabond home with you. I have no supper for drunkards like you. That's enough, Matrina. Don't wag your tongue without reason. You had better ask what sort of man, and you tell me what you've done with the money? Simon found the pocket of the jacket, drew out three rubble note, and unfolded it. Here is the money. Trivanoff did not pay, but promises to pay soon. Matrina got still more angry. angry. He thought, had bought no sheepskins, but had put his only coat on some naked fellow and hadn't even brought him to their house. She snatched up the note from the table, took it to put in away in safety, and said, I have no supper for you. We can't feed all the naked drunkards in the world. There now, Matrina, hold your tongue a bit. First hear what a man has to say. Much wisdom I shall hear from a drunken fool. I was right in not wanting to marry you, a drunkard. The linen my mother gave me, gave me you drank, and now you've been to buy a coat and have drunk it too. Simon tried to explain to his wife that he had only spent twenty kopecks tried to tell her how he had found the man, but Matrina would not let him get a word in. She talked nineteen to the dozen and dragged in things that had happened in ten years before. Matrina talked and talked, and at last she flew Simon and seized him by the sleeve. Give me my jacket. It's the only one I have, and you must needs take it from me and wear it yourself. Give it here, you mangy dog. And may the devil take you. Simon began to pull the, off the jacket and turned a sleeve of it inside out. Matrina seized the jacket and burst its seams. She snatched it up, threw it over her head, and went to the door. She meant to go out, but stopped undecided. She wanted to work off her anger, but she also wanted to learn what sort of man the stranger was. Matrina stopped and said, if he were a good man, he would not be naked. Why, he hasn't even a shirt on him. If he were all right, you would say where you came across the fellow. That's just what I'm trying to tell you, said Simon. As I came into the shrine, I saw him sitting all naked and frozen. It isn't quite the weather to sit about naked. God sent him to me, or he would have perished. What was I to do? How do we know what may have happened to him? So I took him, clothed him, and brought him along. Don't be so angry, Matrina. It is a sin. Remember, we must all die one day. Angry, rose, angry words rose to Matrina's lips, but she looked at the stranger and was silent. He sat on the edge of the bench, motionless, his hands folded on his knees, his head drooping on his breast, his eyes closed, and his bow, brows knit as if in pain. Matrina was silent and... Simon said, Matrina, have you no love of God? Matrina heard these words, and she looked at the stranger. Suddenly, her heart softened towards him. He came back from the door. She came back from the door, and going to the stove, she got out the supper. Setting a cup on the table, she poured out some vase. Then she brought out the last piece of bread and set the knife and two spoons. Eat if you, if you want to, said she. Simon drew the stranger to the table. Take your place, young man, said he. Simon cut the bread, crumbled it into broth, and then they began to eat. Matrina sat at the corner of the table, resting her head on her hand and looking at the stranger. And Matrina was touched with pity, for the stranger had begun to feel fond of him. And at once the stranger's face lit up. His brows were no longer bent. He raised his eyes and smiled at Matrina. When they had finished supper, the woman cleared away the things and began questioning the stranger. 
Where are you from? said she. I am not from these parts. But how did you come to be on the road? I may not tell. Did someone rob you? God punished me. And you were lying there naked? Yes, naked and freezing. Simon saw me and had pity on me. He took off his coat, put it on me, and brought me here. And you have fed me, give me drink, shown pity on me. God will reward you. Matrina rose, took from the window Simon's old shirt she had been patching, and gave it to the stranger. She also brought out a pair of trousers for him. There, said she, I see you have no shirt. Put this on and lie down where you please, in the loft or on the stove. The stranger took off the coat, put on the shirt, and lay down in the loft. Petrina put out the candle, took the coat, and climbed to where her husband lay on the stove. Petrina drew the skirts of the coat over her and lay down, but she could not sleep. She could not get the stranger out of her mind. When she remembered that she had eaten their last piece of bread and that there was none for tomorrow and thought of the shirt and trousers she had given away, she felt grieved. But when she remembered how he smiled, her heart was glad. Long did Matrina lie awake, and she noticed that Simon also was awake. He drew his coat toward him. Simon, well, you have had the last of the bread, and I have not put any to rise. I don't know what we shall do tomorrow. Perhaps I can borrow some from our neighbor Martha. If we're still alive, we shall find something to eat. The woman lay still a while and then said, he seems like a good man, but why does he not tell us who he is? I suppose he has his reasons. Simon, well, we give, but why does nobody give us anything? Simon did not know what to say, so he only said, let us stop talking and turned over and went to sleep. In the morning, Simon awoke. The children were still asleep. His wife had gone to the neighbors to borrow some bread. The stranger was alone, sitting on the bench, dressed in an old shirt and trousers, and looking upward. His face was brighter than it had been the day before. Simon said to him, Well, friend, the belly wants bread and the naked body clothes. One has to work for a living. What work do you know? I do not know any. This surprised Simon, but he said men who want to learn can learn anything. Men work, and I will work also. What is your name? Michael. Well, Michael, if you don't wish to talk about yourself, that is your own affair. But you'll have to earn a living for yourself. If you will work, as I tell you, I will give you food and shelter. May God reward you. I will learn. Show me what to do. Simon took yarn, put it around his thumb, and began to twist. It's easy enough, see? Michael watched him, put some yarn around his own thumb in the same way, caught the knack, and twisted the yarn also. Then Simon showed him how to wax the thread. This also Michael mastered. Next, Simon showed him how to twist the bristle in, and how to screw, and this, too, Michael learned at once. Whatever Simon showed him, he understood at once, and after three days, he worked as if he had sewn boots all his life. He worked without stopping and ate little. When work was over, he sat silently looking upwards. He hardly went into the street, spoke only when necessary, and neither joked nor laughed. They never saw him smile except that first evening when Matrina gave him supper. Day by day, week by week, the year went round. Michael lived and worked with Simon. His fame spread till people said that no one sewed boots so neatly and so strongly as Simon's workman, Michael. From all the district round, people came to Simon for their boots, and he began to be well off. One winter day, as Simon and Michael sat working, a carriage on sledge runners with three horses and sleigh bells and, and bells drove up to the hut. They looked out the window. The carriage stopped at the door. A fine servant jumped down from the box and opened the door. A gentleman in a fur coat got out and walked up to Simon's hut. Up jumped Matrina and opened the door wide. The gentleman stood to enter the hut, and when he drew himself up again, his head nearly reached the ceiling, and he seemed quite to fill his end of the room. Simon rose, bowed, and looked at the gentle man with astonishment. He had never seen anyone like him. Simon himself was lean, Michael was thin, and Matrina was dry as a bone. But this man was like someone from another world, red-faced, burly, with a neck like a bull's, and looking altogether as if he were cast in iron.
The gentleman puffed, threw off his fur coat, and sat on the bench and said, Which of you is the master bootmaker? I am, your excellency, said Simon, coming forward. Then the gentleman shouted to this lad, Hey, Fedka, bring the leather. The servant ran in, bringing the parcel. The gentleman took the parcel and put it on the table. Untie it, said he, and the lad untied it. The gentleman pointed to the leather. Look here, shoemaker, said he. Do you see this leather? Yes, your honor. But do you know what sort of leather it is? Simon felt the leather and said, It is good leather. Good indeed. Why, you fool, you never saw such leather before in your life. It's German and cost twenty rubles. Simon was frightened and said, Where should I ever see leather like that? Just so. Now you can make it into boots for me? Yes, your excellency, I can. Then the German shouted at him, You can, can you? Well, remember whom you are to make them for, and what the leather is. You must make me boots that will wear for a year, neither losing shape nor coming unsewn. If you can do that, take the leather and cut it up. But if you can't say so, I warn you now, if your boots come unsewn and lose shape within a year, I will have you put in prison. If they don't burst or lose shape for a year, I will pay you ten rubles for your work. Simon was frightened and did not know what to say. He glanced at Michael and, nudging him with his elbow, whispered, Shall I take work? Michael nodded his head as if to say, Yes, take it. Simon did as Michael advised and undertook to make the boots that would not lose shape or split for a whole year. Calling his servant, the gentleman told him to pull the boot off his left leg, which he stretched out. Take my measure, said he. Simon stitched a paper measure seventeen inches long, smoothed it out, knelt down, wiped his hands well on the apron so as to not spoil the gentleman's sock, and began to measure. He measured the sole and round the instep, and began to measure the calf of the leg, but the paper was too short. The calf of the leg was thick as a beam. Mind you, don't make it too tight in the leg. Simon switched to another strip of paper. The gentleman switched his toes about in his sock, looking around at the at those in the hut. And as if he so, he noticed Michael. Whom have you there? asked he. This is my workman. He will sew the boots. Mind, said the gentleman to Michael. Remember to make them, so they will last me a year. Simon also looked at Michael and saw that Michael was not looking at the gentleman, but was gazing into the corner behind the gentleman as if he saw someone there. Michael looked and looked, and suddenly he smiled, and his face became brighter. What are you grinning at, you fool? thundered the gentleman. You had better look to it that these boots are ready in time. They shall be ready in good time, said Michael. Mind it is so, said the gentleman, and he put on his boots, and his fur coat wrapped the ladder around him and went to the door. But he forgot to stoop and stuck, struck his head against the lintel. He swore and rubbed his head. Then he took a seat in the carriage and drove away. When he had gone, Simon said, There's a figure of a man for you. You could not kill him with a mallet. He almost knocked out the lintel, but little harm it did him. And Matrina said, Living as he does, how should he not have grown strong? Death itself can't touch such a rock as that.